This is my research position. For three months, I was in the northern Sierra Nevada mountains working on a research project focusing on songbirds and bumblebees in post-fire areas. The overall goal is to provide recommendations for habitat restoration and to gain a better understanding of fire's role within an ecosystem. Join me as I catch some birds, catch some bees, write down some data, and explain how forest fires help shape and maintain an ecosystem. First, let's dive into some quick history of forest fires. In many areas of the U.S., fire has been an important part of the ecosystem. Low-intensity fires help remove dead branches, underbrush, and diseased trees. It also opened up the canopy, allowing light to reach the forest floor for new growth. Some tree species, like the giant sequoia, rely on fire for reproduction. Fire is needed to both open up the tree's cones so the seed can be released, and to clear out other competition, allowing the seedlings to get the full sunlight they need to survive. In the late 1800s and early 1900s, several catastrophic forest fires devastated areas of the U.S. So in 1935, the Forest Service enacted a 10 a.m. policy, where any fire spotted was to be suppressed by 10 a.m. the following morning. Complete fire suppression and prevention became a top priority, and in 1944, the famous Smokey the Bear was created to educate the public about fire prevention. For a while, the fire suppression worked. The number and severity of wildfires decreased from 30 million acres in the 1930s, about the size of New York, to somewhere between 2 to 5 million acres in the 1960s, about the size of Connecticut. The importance of fire wasn't realized until people started noticing that there were no new giant sequoias growing. Other scientific research eventually led to a policy letting areas burn naturally and prescribing burns. And by 1978, the 10 a.m. policy was removed. However, the negative effects from years of fire suppression is still being seen today, and in a devastating way. of underbrush, dead branches, and other combustibles built up in many burn suppressed forests around the U.S., which is why forest fires today are typically hotter and larger fires that tend to leave the landscape barren. In Northern California's Plumas County, something similar has happened. We're working in the Moonlight Fire that occurred in 2007 with little to no competition, Ceanothus brush species are quick to consume the landscape, most notable species being whitethorn, a nasty plant. The logging company's land is easy to spot. Ceanothus herbicide was sprayed, and trees were planted for future logging. The Forest Service and logging company boundaries are quite obvious. If areas such as this were regularly burned or maintained throughout the years, perhaps this could have been avoided. And here's me thinking my camera's taking a picture when it's actually recording. Uh. Anyways, although the fire was highly destructive, it does provide opportunities to study the positive and negative effects of fire. Throughout the season, we'll be visiting various sites on the mountain, both inside and outside the fire perimeter. Those being mercury testing, which includes bird banding and aquatic insect sampling, point counts, and bee plots. The 300 B plots are the only sites to be visited twice in the season. But for now, let's begin in the valley, 
where each morning starts with a long drive up to the mountains to our site. We're a crew of four, Alma, Spencer, Macy, and me. And right now we're setting up mist nets so we can begin catching songbirds and start testing to see if forest fires are causing birds to accumulate mercury. Let me explain what I mean. Mercury is accumulated in the soil and vegetation by both pollution and natural occurrences. Here in the soil, the mercury is immobile and in a sense locked up. It's not going anywhere and it's not easily being taken up by organisms. However, some microorganisms have the ability to convert mercury into methylmercury, causing it to be more bioavailable. The methylmercury can then be easily taken in by organisms and accumulated inside them. Starting at the bottom of the food chain, here algae absorbs methylmercury. Aquatic insects then eat the algae. While a small amount of algae might not have very much methylmercury, eating a lot of it throughout its life causes the aquatic insect to accumulate large quantities of methylmercury. Moving up the food chain, fish or birds then eat a large amount of the aquatic insects causing an even larger amount of methylmercury to accumulate inside them. This is called bioaccumulation. When the amount of a chemical, in this case methylmercury, is amplified the further up the food chain you go. Fire's role in all of this is that it has the ability to rapidly mobilize mercury that's been locked up in the soil. Mercury is vaporized by the fire and sent up into the atmosphere where later it's deposited into the water or back onto the now barren topsoil where rains can easily wash it into the water. With an influx in the amount of mercury in the water, studies have shown that there is then an increase in methylmercury. However, other studies have contradicted this. So, the relation of fire and methylmercury is still not well understood. In order to help learn more about this, we are testing mercury levels in post-fire areas. Each mercury and banding site is located at a stream. The mist nets must be set up within 200 meters of the stream, near where the aquatic insect sampling was done. But I'll talk about that later. Our target bird species are very territorial during the breeding season, and hearing another individual's call on this radio brings them in. Then, the waiting begins. But not for long. Mist netting is in fact the safest way of studying any vertebrate. Ow, oh, don't bite me. One study found that injury rate was around a half a percent. Even with low injury rates, I still had to be well trained for this. Notice the two holds I'm using on the birds. The photographer's grip, shown here, is safely restraining the legs. And the bander's grip, shown here, is the safest way to hold birds of this size. Once we captured a target species, the first thing to do is to place a unique numbered band on its leg. Each bird's leg is measured and given a specific band size. The band is then carefully secured and moved to make sure there's enough play as to not harm the bird. Blowing the feathers out of the way helps sex the birds. Male. During the nesting season, the male's cloaca will become swollen and develop a cloacal protuberance. Most female birds, and some males, develop a brood patch. This is an area on the breast that becomes featherless and highly vascularized in order to transfer warmth to the eggs. Have to sound intelligent and Um, how aged? Uh, C. One by C. CP, BP, etc. BP is a three, BP is a zero. White feather wear is a three. Birds are aged by looking at the feathers. A juvenile can typically be aged by its plumage, as its plumage is usually quite different from an adult. 
but a second or third year adult is often aged by a combination of plumage, molt pattern, and feather wear. The bird's blood is taken to test for mercury. A small amount is collected from a vein near the bird's shoulder. Once collected, cotton is held in place until the bleeding has fully stopped. Lastly, wing measurements are taken and the bird is weighed. If the bird is caught again the following year, the band number can be looked up and all the information recorded can be compared from year to year. Since we're done molesting the birds, they are ready for their release. Now let's check for mercury at the bottom of the food chain, which starts in the streams. This is Karen and Lisa. They're from another crew. Their job is to perform the aquatic insect sampling in the streams near our bird banding sites. And today, Spencer and I will be helping them out. Also, I forgot to catch their real names and get permission to show them in the video, so I made up their names and will not be showing their faces. Aquatic insects spend the majority of their life in their juvenile state in the water. As they emerge from the water as a flying adult, they are eaten by birds. So Casey and Leslie are collecting aquatic insects to see if they are accumulating mercury and sending it up the food chain. Yep. Bugs. I got some bugs. <laughs> Kayla and Lucy are only after specific family groups, which I'll let them explain. So we are uh, taking bugs from five different focal groups that are like based on what they caught last year, five common family groups that you get at every site. And they are Dictiscidae, which are aquatic beetles in their larvae, Heptogeniidae. They kind of look like the jack skeleton. We got Limnophilidae, so that's the case caddisfly, like this guy right here. Oh, yeah. And then Perlidae, which is stonefly, and Riacophilidae, which are free swimming caddisfly. And then everything else you just put back? Yeah, if we have like one group that we have a lot of, we'll keep it. And so I'm keeping the Odonata, which are the um, dragonfly. We then sort through the catch and collect our specific family groups. Caitlin and Liz also collect water and sediment samples from the streams. The bird's blood, insects, water, and sediment is all shipped to a lab and processed for mercury, thus obtaining all the data needed to learn more about fire's role in mercury bioaccumulation. Let's move on to point counts and see how we collect data for restoration efforts in post-fire areas. Isn't this peaceful? Just out after sunrise, listening to songbirds and writing down what ones we hear. Ah, beautiful. But not so fast. First we had to get here, you know. And that can suck. Get up at 2 a.m. Drive up a mountain. In the dark. Walk to the point. Thorn. I think I sprained my ankle there. It's hard to tell though. Cause everything hurts like hell. In the white thorn. I think we're lost now. Do a point. time two more point counts 
house today, Spencer? Uh, well, it's 9 o'clock. I've been working for seven hours. I've got a blister on my foot, a bruise on my hip, and we're not quite done. Well, I think I did sprain my ankle too. <laughs> <laughs> yep, pretty average day in the field. Yep, cool. Climb down through the brush, yeah. Do another point count. Fly your way back up again mm -hmm. You're almost done now Okay, let's look at the specifics of why we're doing this. We are conducting point counts at sunrise to obtain data of habitats along streams in post-fire areas. These riparian zones are areas of increased biodiversity and are very important to some songbird species for providing cover, nesting areas, food, and water. The data collected from the point counts can help provide recommendations to improve riparian areas in need of restoration after a high intensity fire. Restoration efforts can vary and each situation and location may need different strategies, but here's one example. This area here is a natural floodplain and a large riparian zone. If a high intensity fire comes through and clears the area, rains can wash away the now barren soil, causing large amounts of woody debris to enter the stream and dig out the bottom, which increases its depth. When rain and water levels recede, the floodplain becomes cut off from the water supply. Moisture loving riparian plants, such as some willow species, are unable to return to these areas and brush or conifer species move in, which are not favorable for some birds nesting and foraging. If the stream was filled in and restored, it could reach the floodplain and riparian species would return, creating a better habitat for birds. Each point count must occur within three and a half hours of sunrise and lasts a total of seven minutes. Spencer seemingly stares off into nothingness but he's actually looking and listening for birds. Well, I, I think he is. Um, oh, oh, yep, yeah, okay, yeah, he is. When seen or heard, the bird species and its estimated distance is recorded. This data will be vital for determining the species abundance and species diversity of the area. Birds are rarely seen and mostly heard. Here's a western wood peewee. And it's actually the only singing bird I managed to film while working. Ugh. My duty is to perform the rapid vegetation assessment of the plot. Each point count plot has a diameter of 100 meters, which can be found with the use of a rangefinder. Vegetation is recorded as a percentage of total plot area, such as percentage of overstory, riparian hardwoods, brush, and many other defining characteristics. This data will be used to determine the specifics of the habitat area and can be compared to the bird species abundance and species diversity, which can ultimately be used to determine areas in need of restoration and restoration efforts can be recommended. With our set of point counts finished, let's now explore the last section of the project and do a set of B plots. While although the main attraction, it's the journey getting to them that tells a story of the mountains themselves.
just a cow. Some farmers are still granted grazing rights up on the mountains. The cows turn this once beautiful flowering meadow into nothing more than a manicured lawn. This was one of my favorite plots too. There will be no bees at this plot, but this is actually one of the reasons why we're conducting bee plots. Bumblebees typically inhabit meadows, much like where cattle like to graze. So we are seeing how grazing affects bumblebee habitat so we can then provide recommendations for grazing. Fire has the ability to open up dense areas, potentially allowing floral resources and nesting areas to become more abundant. Therefore, we are also determining how fire is affecting bumblebee populations and diversity, allowing us to provide further recommendations for post-fire habitat restoration. But we are mostly on the hunt for this, Bombus occidentalis, aka the western bumblebee, a once widespread species whose populations have declined dramatically in California and are now listed as a vulnerable species. Little is known about their current range or population size, so we will hopefully be able to gather some of this information. Occidentalis' use of burned areas is not well understood. Therefore, we will also determine which vegetation, landscape characteristics, and habitats Occidentalis prefers in post-fire areas. Overall, we will gain a better understanding of Occidentalis and of all bumblebee species' habitat preferences both inside and outside the fire perimeter and can provide recommendations for habitat management. Now, let's try to find another bee plot that wasn't heavily grazed by cows. Here we go. This plot looks promising. Once at the plot, a flag is placed to signify the center of the 20 meter radius plot. All right, now that we're actually in an area that has flowers, let's go catch some bees. Before we begin, we first record a few things about the plot, such as GPS coordinates, air temperature, cloud cover, and percent of plot shaded. Start time is then noted, and we begin our 16 minute survey catching bees. And as always, we keep a keen eye out for the coveted Occidentalis. It often haunts us in our dreams, wondering if we'll ever find one. We worry that they may be forever gone from the mountain range that we cover. But we persist, thinking of them always. Oh, Oxygen Dallas, you've been on my mind. Oh, baby, Oxygen Dallas, you've been on my mind. Oh, won't you be my baby queen bee? Yeah. Oh, won't you be my baby queen bee? When a bumblebee is caught, we stop our timer and put the bee in a numbered vial. The vial is placed in a cooler with ice packs to help calm the bee down for identifying. The flower species that the bee was caught on is recorded, as well as catch time and vial number. Then the timer started again and we continue with the survey. Sometimes the bees are already caught before we can get to them, but everything needs to eat. Alma, sing this next part for me. The Octantalus, you've been on my mind. Oh, baby, Octantalus, you've been on my mind. Won't you be my baby queen bee? Oh, won't you be my baby queen bee? Uh, Macy, you try. Occidentalis, you've been on my mind. Oh, baby, Occidentalis, you've been on my mind. Won't you be my baby queen bee? To be my baby queen bee. Uh, thanks, guys. Once the survey is finished, the end time is noted, and then it's time to ID all the flowers on the plot. Normally, we only do the top five most abundant flowers on the plot, but here I'll show you all the most common flowers we encounter. There are always new flower species beginning to bloom as soon as some others die off, so we are constantly learning to identify different flower species throughout the season. Personally, I've gotten pretty good at IDing flower species. Here's a newly bloomed species. Let's watch me, the master, ID it. Hmm. <laughs> 
That's it. Yep. While the bees are still chilling in the cooler, we also do a vegetation survey. The vegetation survey is done just like when we did them for the point counts, except we get a little more detailed. For the bee plots, we identify the two most abundant tree species and identify all the brush species and the percentage of the plot they take up. The vegetation survey and flower identification is important because this is used to determine which habitats, plants, and landscape characteristics are most preferable for bumblebee populations, diversity, and even specific bee species. Also, recording burn severity and number of snags gives an idea of the bee's preferences towards burned or unburned areas. Oh, here we go. One of my favorite things about the job is eating all the wild berries I find on the mountain. This is bitter cherry. I haven't tried it yet, but I'm told it's edible. Oh my god. Ugh, tastes like a million pine needles blended up and packaged in a little juice ball. Ugh, awful. Enough vegetation. Let's go ID the bees we caught. With the bees temporarily dormant and easier to handle from the cooler, we first determine which class the bee is, queen, worker, or male. Queens are a lot larger when compared to the workers of the same species. Here's a bifarious queen next to a worker. It may not look that much bigger to you, but after you've handled a few dozen bifarious workers, you notice the difference more. This is a nevidensis queen, and the largest bumblebee on the mountain. The camera does not do her beauty justice. Next, if it's not a queen, it's a male drone or a female worker. A dead giveaway for a worker is when she is full of pollen. If there isn't pollen present, then we can look at a few other things. The hind leg of the workers has a corbicula. A corbicula is a section of the leg with a cavity surrounded by hairs for collecting pollen. It's this pyramid-shaped section here. The males do not have a corbicula, and therefore do not collect pollen. This section of the male's leg is teardrop-shaped. However, sometimes the shape of the leg or corbicula is not as obvious, and we must then count the turga, which are individual segments of the abdomen. The workers and queens have six turga, whereas the males have seven turga. It should also be worth noting that males cannot sting and have a penis instead of a stinger. Now we identify the species. Let's ID three very similar looking species step by step to show you what we look for. Fervitus, Vosnesensky, and Van Dyke. These three different species all have a single yellow band on one of their turga. The Van Dyke is easier to pick out. Their yellow band is on the third turga, while the Fervitus and Vosnesensky have a yellow band on the fourth turga. To tell these two apart, we'll look at their faces. The face of the Vosnesensky is yellow, while the Fervitus is black. However, sometimes an old Vos worker may be missing hair and its face may appear black or bald. So we then look at their cheek length. The Fervitus cheek is taller than it is wide, whereas the Vosnesensky cheek is equally wide as it is tall. <sighs> yes, tedious. Generally, we ID species by looking at their color pattern, face color, and cheek length. There are some other characteristics we look out for depending on the species, but you get the basics of how to ID them. All in all, we have a total of 15 species to look out for. On top of that, the male's color patterns are usually different from the workers of the same species, and sometimes the males from different species all look the same, making it a pain to ID them. Another thing worth noting is that a species can have different color patterns depending on their geographic location. The Occidentalis variant in our range is pretty easy to spot. It has a white butt. Look at that white butt. Sometimes it can appear slightly yellow, so we also look for a black face and a short cheek. So now that you know how to ID them a little bit, now you get to watch me process over 40 bees. Here we go. When we process the bees and identify them, we take several pictures of each individual's identifying characteristics for record keeping and to double check our species ID later. As the bees slowly warm up from the sun, they fly away unharmed, ready to resume their pollinating duties. For each individual bee, we will have what flower it was caught on, what time of day it was caught, what species it is, 
whether it was a queen, male, or worker, and what location it was caught at. This data will help associate habitats and flora resources with specific bee populations and overall bee diversity. Now I know what you're wondering, and no, there was no Occidentalis in this catch. In fact, out of the 3,612 bees caught throughout the entire season, no one caught an Occidentalis. Except for one person. No, no, not Spencer. The only person to catch the one Occidentalis the entire season was the greatest hero on the mountain, the top bumbler, <clears throat> your humble narrator, me. And here's the big catch. Unfortunately, I forgot my camera equipment that day, and the only footage I got was when I had Alma take pictures of the bee so I could film with my phone. My phone promptly died after this. But the Occidentalis worker lived, giving us serenity, knowing that because we caught a worker, there was at least one queen on this mountain range, and giving us hope that there may be others. As the season comes to an end, we reflect on the suffering we endured. I was unable to film during the many times of hardships, and what I did film, the camera does not do justice on displaying how truly difficult the terrain, vegetation, weather, and elevation is. But on the other hand, the camera also isn't good at showing the absolute beauty of everything on the mountain range. With an increase in size and frequency of wildfires, and declining bee populations across the U.S., we can leave knowing that the data we collected will be helpful for future management of forest land post-fire, and will expand upon our knowledge of mercury bioaccumulation. I'm Travis, and thanks for watching. I'm off now to my next research position. <laughs>